Shibo, eventually the Supreme Court rightly determined this is a personal decision. This is not the decision of the state. This is not the decision of some agency to step in. Well, because of our moral views, this is what you should do. And in the final analysis, I mean, what you're looking at here is a healthy brain. Terry Scheibel's brain. I mean, she had less brain matter in her brain than probably, you know, someone with, uh, I, won't, I won't go there. I was you know, going to use a, a presidential assassination. This is a person that is no longer has the, the, the intellectual capacity to function in any way, shape, or form. Right? These are the kinds of situations that result from saying, no, we want a large federal government to be asking questions of individual, uh, uh, very personal kind of decisions. Okay? By 2006, or 2000, I should say, George W. Bush, the son of George Herbert Walker Bush, literally puts in a faith-based initiative advisor. Um, this is something that was kept by uh, Barack Obama. This is something that was kept by Donald Trump. This is something that has been kept by President Biden. So it is an advising position in the White House that literally is bringing in a religious perspective. And it obviously has all kinds of strange computations to it. David Cowell, the guy in the lower right, Texan, evangelical Christian, um, he writes a book about it. He's the very first person that's put into this situation. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about things like Martin Luther King talked about, or about the anti-abortion, or anti, you know, what are the elements of faith that we are going to talk about? Cow's own book. He said they were there to simply develop uh, Republican, you know, political talking points, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. Right? And so if you recognize what cultural or, or liberal cultural, you know, cultural liberalism, cultural conservatism, they have nothing to do with the concepts of both liberalism and conservative. What they do very effectively is get people mad, get people angry, get people to be growing signs and you know vegetables and fruits and whatnot. Right? Um, this is this is the nascent part of the new right of Reagan's revolution. And again, it's not so much the growth of the politicians willing to do it; it's the growth of the public marketplaces, the cable news, uh, the internet, and etc. That, is, that, is, that has become sort of Frankenstein's monster as a result of it, right? The final, the fifth group, and really the heart of what Reagan revolution is all about is what's kind of simplified as supply side economics. This is the Chicago, uh, the Chicago School, Milton Friedman and others uh, that I read about from, from the shock doctrine. Their argument is in regards to the changes that are taking place globally in regards to capitalism. That industrial capitalism is a labor-driven process. That by 20, 19, 1980, I should say, American labor carries with it a cost of a minimum earning potential and American way of life that makes labor costs too expensive for industrial capitalism. And so if the United States is going to continue to drive forward with, with capitalism, it's going to be as a finance capitalist economy. Their argument is to make this transformation as quickly as possible. And the central component is, is to free up capital, is to, in essence, slice it away from the control of the state so that capital can do what capital needs to do, which is great. Again, I showed the clip from, uh, um, you know, from Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, and greed is good, and all that kind of stuff. And inherently, every time you see a movie, you associate yourself with a star, right? But I would imagine there aren't any billionaires in this class. I certainly am not one, right? I'm just, that, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about somebody with a retirement fund. We're talking about billions of dollars of liquidity. And the argument is one that is going to, Arthur Laffer, the University of Southern California argument, is going to make a very simple argument to Ronald Reagan. Again, Reagan is not stupid, but he's not an intellectual. Again, Franklin Roosevelt sort of the same thing. And Reagan used to famously say, well, I learned the Laffer curve when I, you know, by looking at a cocktail map. And he explained it to me on a cocktail map. And I'm here to, in essence, defend Reagan's argument because it is simple enough to say, right? Arthur Laffer, again, he's a Southern California, University of Southern California economist, is going to make it a pretty, pretty direct art. You know, again, these numbers are arbitrary, federal revenues, who knows what numbers and what those are. But he makes, a, he makes the, case, the point of case, right? And that is, these are the tax rates. So if I go to work and I'm taxed at 100%, let me just restate that. If tomorrow, the state of Texas installs a 100% income tax, you won't see me on Wednesday. Right? That's called slavery. That's called, you go to work and we're keeping all the money. No, 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 we won't do that. Right? So as a case in point, if the federal government had a 100% tax rate, how much money would the federal government bring in? Zero. Make sense? 
Yeah, makes sense, right? No one's going to work if everything is being taxed at all. If you tax at 0%, hey, you know, mana falling from heaven. If there's no taxes in what have you, wonderful. Everyone gets to keep all the money that they work for. How much money is coming into the federal government? If you're taxing at zero, zero is coming in. With me so far, right? You're sitting around drinking, having drinks with Reagan and Arthur Laffer, and he's got his cocktail napkin out, and you're like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Laffer makes, a, makes two assumptions. Number one, that it's a clean curve like this. First of all, it isn't. People behave very differently. We, you know, we, we have different different motivations and all the rest of that. So it's not this kind of bell curve. But the argument is at some point in time, wherever this tax rate is, you're going to be bringing the most amount of money. Right? If you lower the tax rates, you're going to be missing opportunities to bring in revenues. If you raise the tax rate, people are just not going to work as hard. Right? So the argument is, is that if you slide on this curve one way or the other, you're going to be able to influence the amount of money that's brought in. Lapper's first assumption is this is a smooth curve. It isn't. But his second assumption is where the United States tax rate is right now. His argument is, and again, forget the numbers here. I'm not, it's not a 75% tax rate. But his argument is that we are located, we are an overtaxed society. And that if you are taxed at this rate, you can cut the taxes. Right? So you're going to cut the tax rate. What's going to happen to revenue if I go from this point to this point? Revenue is going to go up. Right? That's trickle-down economics. That is the argument that says those with money who are going to have an incentive to make more money are going to have that capital trickle down on the rest. So the focus isn't over here. The focus is over there. Right? Make sense? Kind of, sort of. You can cut taxes and increase revenue. Right? So that's what that analysis is basically saying. The question becomes, this assumption, is the United States an overtaxed society? This, again, these numbers are pretty consistent over time. This is 2008. I know that's over a decade ago. But you see the total tax percentage of GDP, the United States is relatively low. Right? And more importantly, when you look at tax revenues, what you see is, and this is a, obviously too busy slide, the corporate tax rate here, Here's Reagan in 1980. He is going to cut it. It's not, I mean, 3%. These are not double digit 15, 20%. Personal income taxes are a hell of a lot higher than that. What is that saying? It's saying, in essence, that businesses are paying a hell of a lot less for the use of money than you and I, right? Plain and simple. And have been, so this one goes to, again, about 2000, what, 2010, something like that. And have been. So the assumption that we're on the right side of that curve is largely an incorrect one. And what it does is to, in essence, focus on a very small percentage of the American uh, uh, population. The chief goals of the Reagan administration, how do you evaluate an administration? By the laws they pass. Now, if I stand there like idiots with the signing orders and whatnot, what are you able to get this dysfunctional federal government to pass into law? And what Reagan is going to get passed into law there's nothing about school prayer, there's nothing about Terry Schiavo, there's nothing about gays and all the rest of that stuff, because why, right? That's not a conservative principle. What they pass into law are focuses on capital gains. Okay? Again, look and see what was passed by the previous administration. One piece of legislation to lower capital gains. That's, you know, if you don't recognize it, oh yeah, but I got to rally with all my flags, great. You knock yourself out. Right? It used to be people would do that with baseball teams and football and you know the who or whatever. You know, I mean, you, you do that with cultural activities. Now culture has become politics. The idea is to lower and limit capital gains taxation and federal regulation for social programs. So who the hell cares about people having to pay thirty, forty thousand dollars in student debt? Right? When I went through college in the 1970s, I paid for every penny of my education. My total cost for that was about $3,500, $3,500. For five and a half years, I was on a five and a half year plan. Five and a half years of college education, $3,500. That can get you through maybe a semester now. Who pays for that? You do, right? You're on your own. Go get them, tiger. Right? And society looks and says, well, of course, because I'm conservative, right? Because I'm an independent. I'm told that that makes me a man. Okay, it also puts you deeply, deeply in debt and competing against an economic system that is rewarding capital. Right? Again, go back to you got to get access to capital. The only way middle class gets access to capital, property ownership, uh, the, the stock market. 
Those are the two uh, only ways in which to do this. Uh, reduce federal regulation, particularly environmental regulation, and to continue what Carter did. Carter went, went after inflation, and Reagan continues to do so as well. Right? These are all financial. This is going to do with race. It's going to do with religion. It's going to do with men and women, gender and sexuality. Right? And as a result, again, Reagan wouldn't get a hearing today in the current uh, Republican Party because it has been completely co-opted by cultural conservatives. Right? Most traditional, his own vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, calls this voodoo economics. Where is the money going to come from? How are you going to pay for all this big military? What are you going to be able to do? The traditional assumptions about American economics was you're building up an infrastructure of middle class workers. This is disappearing under finance capital. What you're doing under finance capital is rewarding ownership. It's the one thing that is going to get any kind of financial uh, uh, incentive. Working your way to the top means that you're working your way to get access to capital. And that capital better be in productive use. You buy new phones and new cars and new trucks and what have you, say goodbye to the capital. You've been convinced to, to give it to somebody else, right? All the goodies, all the Kardashians, all that kind of shit, right? The policies are going to follow this in two phases. The first is in He's elected in 1980 and 1981 to Kemp Roth's uh, tax act. Takes almost a trillion dollars from the top tax brackets. Um, uh, the biggest one, income tax, the biggest one is right here, the Garden St. Germain Act in 1982. It, ho it wholly deregulates industries that have a public access. So it, it deregulates television, it deregulates radio, it deregulates, uh, you know, what is an emerging online. What does that mean? It means that there's no public connection to those entities. Here's where cable television kind of it has its birth. Airlines, savings and loan, financial institutions. And we have had subsequent to that, not one, not two, but three complete collapses of these industries. Guess who's had to bail them out? You have. I have. Taxpayers have. Oh, you get to keep all the profits, but when the shit hits the fan, what happens? We, you're too big to fail. We can't allow you to fail. We'll bail you out. Right? So you get all the goodies, but you don't get any of the, any of the risk associated with that. Right? That's the Reagan Revolution. Right? So if you want to stand tall and, you know, again, all the cultural stuff is do what you do what you got to do. Right? But to recognize what grown-ups are talking about, what the reality of this transformation is, is an economic shift that has deep repercussions to kind of how we see ourselves in American society. Um, if you're into such things, and again, the Congressional Budget Office has got all of this data, right? So it's all public record. What you're looking at here is these are the Reagan, these are the Reagan cuts. And they, they are, I would say, 90 to 95% of the revenue that comes into, everybody pays income taxes, right? 90 to 95% of the revenue that drives the American government is coming from these top three uh, brackets. Right? And so it's going to hamstring the amount of money that is going to be there. It's Reagan's own vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush, who is going to raise those back up. So a Republican, read my lips, no new taxes. He's looking and saying, the United States is going bankrupt. And I'm unwilling to allow the United States to go bankrupt. And so this Republican is going to raise taxes. And Bill Clinton is unwilling to spend money of that coming in to, to, to kind of get uh, 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 even balanced. Balanced fiscal budget, right? They're lowered again in 2004, and then again um, in 2018. So I think 2018 lowers these to around 24 um, percent. You can see down here, you know, particularly Reagan bucks. I mean, the, the, those numbers are going to go up and down. It doesn't have a dramatic effect. In other words, you know, 500 dollars here or there. Here you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Um, if not millions. Um, Last, last slide of this. There's also kind of this open debate as to, so here's Reagan, here's where the cuts begin right here. Um, period of time where you have higher personal income tax rates, there's also a period of time when you have the highest level of productivity in the United States. Why is that? Because this money is going to infrastructure, roads, education, healthcare, right? It's going to things to make the American public more uh, uh, productive not to simply say, well, capital is capital, and we're going to keep feeding the title. Um, so these are all obviously much more complicated, much more uh, intense debates. Um, but, the, but the perception at the time is to say, 
capital is being is being uh, you know sort of unfairly uh, um, uh, handed. What this does is, for the first time, at least in the modern era, is to in essence say you're on your own, right? Reconstruction, progressivism, the New Deal, the Great Society, all of them are asking Americans to sacrifice for the greater good. Saying, in essence, you may be okay, but the people next to you are not. You owe it to each other to be able to do this. What you can do now is to say, go to hell with them, right? They're probably gay anyway. And I'm not sure about their grandparents and all that. I'm not sure about the racial issues, okay? We can look at those kind of cultural issues to, in essence, divide us to say, I'll be damned if I give a penny of my income towards someone else who may be hurting or may have something these new policies don't, there's no new policies to deal with. And the, the, when we come back to the statistics, the middle class is the one that's going to take it the most uh, forcefully. It's the middle class, not the poor. The poor are still the poor, and not the very wealthy. They're largely going to be um, turned into aristocracy, right? If you have millions of dollars, you're going to be able to inherit millions of dollars, and you really aren't part of the same kind of world in which everyone else is. It's the middle class which is going to see the greatest struggles as a result of this. The culture of the period of time, cultural historian, is really fascinating. During the 1940s and 1950s, what you see is this mass culture. Everybody is sort of the same. And even the consumer culture, a refrigerator is a refrigerator. It's not a sub-zero refrigerator. That's, you know, it's not a Viking range that's this, that, or the other thing. He said most people could afford the basic amenities. Even if you were relatively poor, you had an icebox. Even if you were relatively poor, you'd have, you'd have air conditioning or an electric fan. right? This begins to differentiate by the time you get to the 1980s, and suddenly, brand consciousness, right? There's always been General Motors, and they became General Motors largely because of brands, because they recognized that a Ford is different than a, you know, a Chevrolet is different than a, a, a Cadillac, and et cetera, et cetera. But this notion of kind of the United States as being a first-class society was always kind of pushed back. That's Europe. Europe is the one that has all the elites, that has all of the Oh, well, this is ground coffee. This is uh, demi toss. This is a certain. That begins to change. Now your culture is now going to reflect how sophisticated and wealthy you, you can be. Right? And it's going to have a very dramatic effect on the way in which, particularly masculinity, masculinity under assault as a result of civil rights, white masculinity in particular, as a result of civil rights, as a result of women entering the workforce, as a, women, as a result of women successfully entering higher education and largely kind of equating that difference very quickly. And for the most part, the culture of the 1980s begins to see this sort of, the, the fancy word is fetishizing. It sounds kind of dirty. It is, it's focusing on one thing, right? And particularly the hard bodies. Why did I show you Madonna today? Because Madonna is emblematic of that from the female standpoint. But the male heroes of this period of time are all hard bodies. Right? And why is that important? Because film is, again, one of these, film has these weird terms of perversity and whatever. You're largely, when you watch a film or television, you're largely acting as a peeping Tom. You can stare at people the way you wouldn't do in a public setting. You can look at body parts. You can look at activities. You can do things like that. It's called the gaze. If you're interested, the, 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 the film version of it is the gaze. The, 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 the camera has a gaze on it. And this gaze is going to focus increasingly on hard bodies, right? So a lot of men watching men who have a lot of muscles and a lot of pectorals and all the rest of that stuff. And they are, they are individuals who are going to highlight this idea of because I'm bald, because it's leg day, you know, because of this, I don't have to follow the rules. Only babies, only pussies follow the rules, right? You know, the, the, the Rambo, do we get to win this time? Do you have any concept of what Vietnam you know, we had plenty of things that went boom in Vietnam. No one held the United States military back in Vietnam. We lost that war because we had no idea what victory looked like, right? Most of them are going to refer to like John Wayne as the man's man. If you really understand John Wayne movies, if you've ever seen a John Wayne movie, John Wayne movie is all about conformity. The male figure is going to step in. I mean, the biggest one is Sands of Iwo Jima is when he gets this group of sort of either cowards or misfits or what have you, and he forces them to conform to Big Daddy, 
right? Not to be an individual, not to, I'm gonna say dirty words because I can't. I'm gonna, I'm gonna act out as, as, as childishly as I want to. John Wayne forces conformity. That is not what we're looking at here. A dirty Harry gets to break the rules because he's tired of seeing this criminal get away. You know, Coney and Terminator and the rest of them get to slice heads off. And women are the same way, right? Madonna gets to sleep her way to the top. What it's doing is, in essence, making this argument of the 1960s. I'm going to be sexually who I am. I'm going to be open about who I am. But I'm going to do it at the, at the, at the expense of others in society. You don't have big boobs, too bad for you. I'm going to marry the rich guy. You don't have big muscles, too bad for you. I'm going to slice this guy's head off if he gets in my way. And you see this kind of rise of individualism, which is antisocial, right? I'm saying, in essence, I'm not here to protect the people like me. I'm here to tell them what to do. I'm here to tell them this is the new reality, right? Which by itself is not a great thing. However, there's always a however, right? As this starts, I was like kind of comparing this. Again, it's a cultural story. There are some major exceptions, right? And one of them is one movie I'm pretty sure most people in the room have seen, and that's Ghostbusters, right? Ghostbusters is a huge hit in 1984, partially because of the humor, partially because of the stars, a lot of Saturday Night Live stars, partially because of the science fiction, the special effects, right? But it, I would argue also is a success because it's tapping into that positive element of entrepreneurialism. One of the things that Americans do better than almost any other people on the planet is take risks. We're willing to assume risk. And what the Ghostbusters are about is this idea of saying, the world is changing, right? We're living in this really complex world. And I need to take risks and to assume those risks to be able to be successful. Um, you know, Roosevelt himself, nothing to fear but fear itself is applicable to what the Ghostbusters are doing here. Who are the characters in this? And Harold Ramis, who passed away a few years ago, had spoken about how eerily this kind of this, this kind of models the 1980s. And he's like, no, we were just writing a movie, we're having fun with it. But you have, who's the source of the problem of the Ghostbusters, if you've seen the movie? The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, right? Led by, you know, Mr. Pecker. Um, this guy who they're constantly, he's not even a man, he doesn't have a dick, he does, you know, he's dickless and blah, blah, blah. Um, the women in this are either, you know, sex kitten kind of, you know, the, the bad person is this, hey, nimble little minx kind of thing, or the damsel in distress. They're not there to help or to add or to do anything, they're there as the, as the uh, imperiled individual. Uh, even race, as you're going to see, is sort of meaningless to this concept. Um, and you'll see in the clip the, the rise of those who have these kind of conceptions of, of, of religious uh, uh, payments of sort of Armageddon or uh, end of times kinds of kinds of assumptions. The last scene in the, in the one of the later scenes in the movie is the Ghostbusters have been arrested. They're brought in to see the mayor, right? And so for this scene, just kind of think of the mayor as Ronald Reagan. Just think of the or any politician, right? And the way in which they talk about social problems, the way in which the Ghostbusters talk about race and gender and ethnicity and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, you'll see no women in here, and that is also part of the sort of 80s culture. So Reitman is the director. Combustion known to man. 
This beats the hell out of me. The walls in the 53rd precinct were bleeding. How do you explain that? Good afternoon, Good gentlemen. Job. Oh, your eminence. Oh. How are you, Lenny? You're looking good, Mike. We're in a real fix here. What do you think I should do? Let me. Officially, the church will not take any position on the religious implications of these uh, phenomena. Personally, let me. I think it's a sign from God. But don't quote me on that. No, I think that's a smart move, Mike. Well, I'm not going to call a press conference and tell everyone to start praying. <clears throat> oh. I'm uh, Winston Zeddemore, Young. I've only been with the company for a couple of weeks. But I got to tell you, these things are real. Since I joined these men, I have seen shit that will turn you white. Where well, you believe, Mr. Peck, my name is Peck. Or you could accept the fact that this city is headed for a disaster of biblical proportion. What do you mean, biblical? What he means is Old Testament, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Real wrath of God type stuff. Sir. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. What if you're an entrepreneur and you're wrong? What if you're wrong? If I'm wrong, nothing happens. We go to jail peacefully, quietly. We'll enjoy it. But if I'm right, and we can stop this thing. Lenny, you will have saved the lives of millions of registered voters. <laughs> I don't believe you're seriously considering listening to this man. I'm gonna get you a nice fruit basket. I'm gonna miss him. Give me the last. We got work to do. Now, what do you need from me? There, when you start stepping through that, our what entrepreneur?